Um, so the um, couple of things we'll just do here real quick is uh, put up some uh, put up some uh, uh, our hyperledger code of conduct in the uh, in the chat and uh, the antitrust uh, and the antitrust. Uh, oh, hang on a second. There's a link to our antitrust, our, our code of conduct. Our antitrust. We'd like everyone to uh, join our LinkedIn page. I'm gonna put a... Uh, a link to our uh, our LinkedIn page here for the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment SIG. <clears throat> and we can start today. I'm Brett Russell, co-chair of the Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. Today, I am pleased to introduce Jay Deverett. Jay is a manager at Deloitte Consulting in Toronto overseeing blockchain digital assets and payments. Jay is no stranger to the entertainment industry, having produced three feature films, which were distributed by Netflix, Disney, and ABC Family. Today, we will find out how Jay's preoccupation with blockchain technology is shaping his ideas of a Web3 collaborative storytelling and how blockchain will disrupt IP ownership in the entertainment industry. I will add that today is just day one. Stay tuned after today for more events with our Hyperledger Media and Entertainment SIG as we continue to engage with Jay and anyone that wishes to participate in ongoing efforts to build on Jay's vision using permissioned Hyperledger fabric and compatible technologies and blockchains. Welcome, Jay. Good to see you. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. And um yeah, that was a great intro. Um, as Brett said, uh, I'm at Deloitte. I do a lot of work in blockchain and payments. I'm in our a manager in our blockchain and digital assets group. I previously was a film producer, and I, the, when I first saw smart contracts um, back in 2017, I just I shifted to this industry alongside just seeing the streaming wars between Netflix and Amazon Prime Video start to take off. And it was clear to me that there was going to be a disruption in this industry stemming from blockchain. I just didn't exactly know how yet. And um, I know that some of you who are in this meeting right now might be left over from the last one. So uh, pleased to have you here. The topic of this really is um, how blockchain can disrupt IP ownership in the entertainment industry. And if you've been paying attention at all just to the rough headlines, uh, there we right now we have strikes going on with the Writers Guild, with the Actors Union in the in the states, and um, which is extending over to Canada. And the main reason behind all of that is just revenue slash compensation and what really traces back to ownership. So what I'm going to do just because it's I always find it's best to sort of start this conversation from this part. I'm going to share my screen um, because. I want to start with just a little overview of how the entertainment industry actually, how, how, the, how the modern entertainment industry actually works. Um, so just one second, I'm going to share screen and let me know when you are able to see it. Someone just give me a little thumbs up. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, Jay, it's all good. Okay, great. And yeah, we'll, we'll leave plenty of time for questions. So the current state of entertainment companies, this is in 2023. Um, there's a, a really great VC named Matthew Ball who writes a lot on this topic, but entertainment and what it is has really shifted. Whereas it used to be a model of just making something that's entertainment, entertaining and then getting it picked up by a distributor to go into theaters, 
that's no longer what we're looking at. We have a few conglomerates, conglomerates absolutely suffocating oxygen out of the industry. And that is because they are able to produce content across all channels and to mine their existing IP. And I'll get into what I mean by that in a second. But in order to be successful as an entertainment company in 2023, you need to be building franchises. You need to be building IP that you are then continually building love for via other channels and then repeating. So let's just use Disney as an example because they are the best example. Disney is what actually, Disney's goal as a business, even though you see their films in um, on massive screens and hear about them breaking billion dollar records with, with Avengers movies, Disney's goal is actually not to get you into seats in their theater. Disney's goal is to have your kids and your nephews and nieces wanting to wear Spider-Man pajamas and wanting and and just wanting to ride the rides at their parks. Um, they essentially stretch across as many verticals as they can. And what they have that is really unique is they own these franchises in the form of Marvel and Star Wars. So they, and what, what they have unique in Marvel is they have a low cost, low margin business in their comic book business. They have a really low cost incubator where they can create all this source material and actually test it on their low end market that buys, that buys comic books. And when they go out to make a movie or, or a TV show, they already know what's popular because they have had the ability to test out their IP in, in their markets already. Now, for any company that is smaller than Disney, AKA basically any company, this is just simply not a possibility. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, I, I, I'll assume that I don't need to get into the reasons why a, a startup company can't afford to, to build a, a theme park, to build a, a Disney World type, uh, type establishment. But essentially it is just, it's become a problem because in order to get your film into a theater, you need to be able to project massive, massive ticket sales. And there are very few companies other than the, than those that produce blockbusters that can even convince the theaters of that. You've, if you've heard of A24, there are certain tastemakers that have been able to be successful in securing theatrical release spots for, for um, you know, more indie productions, but it's very, very rare. So another thing to note though, is that even Disney and even the Netflixes of the world they cannot do it all. They cannot do all of this. Specifically, one one area that has been become increasingly important for entertainment companies to capture is video gaming. And Netflix and Disney have both tried and failed at at launching their launching their video games in house. And that's because it is this. It, it's because for an entertainment company that does screen. Product, uh, screen entertainment to build video games. It's the same as asking a film producer to open a restaurant. They're just completely different competencies. So as it says along the bottom here, partnerships are required when building love for IP via channels that are beyond your core competency. And Disney, the most successful video games based on Disney's content in the last couple of years have been those where they've licensed out their IP. So right off the bat, we can see that there is some teamwork required when uh, even even when you're Disney, right? There has to be some sort of decentralization of IP in order to in order to get that in order to sort of bring these areas alive. So now let's expand this framework a little bit and let's talk about if IP is at the center of any of any entertainment company. Where does IP come from? So you have four options, and you know this is like this is not an exact science, but this is the world as I'm going to present it today. Um, and uh, it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty exhaustive view. So your first option is you can mine your own source material, and what do I mean by that? It's exactly what I just talked about with Disney and owning the comic books. It's if you already own a catalog of source material, um, you can do more with it. It's the same way that on Netflix, if they already own Stranger Things, they can create. A, and they need to boost some viewer numbers, they can put out, and they're between shooting seasons, they can put out a making, a, like a, you know, a making of Stranger Things uh, documentary, or they can go do some sort of event or installation in a mall. They, that's the type of thing of mining their own source material. Then we go to build original. 
this is what the big film studios do. Um, the Foxes, the Warner Brothers, they just develop scripts. They develop original scripts. You've got, you know, like the franchises we all know and love, the, the national treasures and this and that. Those that are sort of just out of the vision of one, of one writer or one team of writers. This is extremely expensive because you're dealing with, and I, I mean, let's just say they're both expensive to actually come into. The, when, when flipping back to mining your own source material, you need to be able to own a catalog that people actually love, right? So it's like either you stumbled into some, to a series that people love or you haven't. Um, uh, yeah, and then when it comes to building original, you're dealing with the writer's union for this. So you're paying big amounts to get your scripts written. It's also just, you're taking a huge gamble. Look at how many blockbuster movies are marketed for over a year and then just flop. When you're building original IP, anything can happen and it's a, it's a high risk investment. Then we get to licensing. This has become sort of, and licensing also includes adaptation. So um, what we see a lot in uh, this, this is most is best captured by what we've seen in sort of the young adults fiction category and tons of tons of categories of movies but you know the hunger games and the and divergent and all these like massive series that are all in your face those are licensed from authors and that is that's a model right it's just you somebody creates it you license it from them the studios might fight over the licensing rights but then once it's done uh once the deal is done you're making movies on it and then you know the it's the same thing HBO is doing with Game of Thrones and you just hope that you have a, a large dependency on whoever created the series to keep writing the source material. And otherwise, otherwise, if that writer drops off for some reason, you're going to need to figure it out. And if anyone in this room watches Game of Thrones, you see what the, it's a perfect example of the risk when the actual, when the adaptation eclipses the, the source material and the source material is not there yet and, it dis and the result disappoints the fan base and severely lessens the value of the brand. Finally, we're going to get to the fourth option, which is the topic of where we're going to go from here. And this is leveraging open source IP. So what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, open source is a term that is so familiar in the software development world, and it's actually much less familiar in the creative world. But why should it be right? They are the same thing. People are just out there creating source material the same way that they're creating that they're writing code. Why can we not, why shouldn't we be able to leverage open source IP? And let's get into next, what do we mean by open, by open source IP? So what makes, whoops, I'm going to, my screen share just went away, one second, sorry. Any questions in the meantime? Well, I am, um, pull this back up. No questions in the chat right now. Okay, great. I'm going to pull this back up. Um, okay, here we go. So what makes viable open source IP? So there are sort of two ways that we have seen this coming that occasionally interplay with one another. Um, uh, and there's some really great examples. So uh, collaborative storytelling, let's start with that on the bottom, can include a whole bunch of number of things. It's There are communities for it that we see on Reddit. So like it goes from, it, it can be just a really fun, it can be a really fun exercise that is just storytelling where people build upon each other. And probably the most famous example of that is fan fiction. So I'm sure a lot of people may or may not know this, but if you've heard of the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise, Fifty Shades of Grey started as Twilight fan fiction, which of course was um, not like not legal, strictly speaking, right? Because we talked about in, in our previous slide, that would have been the licensing part of this, that somebody, some movie studio licensed the Twilight books and then online, they just, with no intention to make money out of it, um, started just writing fan fiction about it that drifted far away enough, that it drifted far enough from the source material that it shouldn't actually be, that it wasn't actually a, a copyright infringement anymore. Um, but the thing was, once it drifted far enough from, once it drifted far enough from Twilight fan fiction, all of a sudden, it was just people adding on, collaborating and adding on to stories and stories. And all of a sudden, one day, a, a, a publishing studio licensed somebody's book, Fifty Shades of Grey, and the community really revolted against it. They basically said, this book is full of stuff that she that was contributed upon from, from the rest, from the wider community. She's getting full credit for this. 
they actually appealed to the author of the Twilight books to say, like, can't you sue her? Uh, can, or, or can't you sue her or shut this whole thing down, like, given it started off of Twilight? And the court actually ruled that there was no case because it had drifted far enough from the original source material. So unfortunately, the fan fiction community kind of actually just dispersed after that. Like that event killed the fan fiction community and we don't really see it anymore. With the exception of the, you know, like uh, their platforms called Wattpad, et cetera, where it's just people really purely trying to, to write fan fiction on their own, but there is no more collaborative fan fiction. You really only see collaborative storytelling now on really niche internet communities. Um, and most like mostly Reddit, others like others like that. Um, now let's get into Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a really cool concept. It's a nonprofit that extends a license for IP to be used freely and for those who use it to to just to be able to use IP um, freely and create whatever they want off of it, but they have to credit all the original off, off all the original creators. So the most famous example of the Creative Commons license is Dungeons and Dragons. And whether or not whether or not you know what Dungeons and Dragons is, you've surely heard of that. It is a massive gaming brand, and anyone at any time can just adopt the Creative Commons license and make any IP from. From um from Dungeons and Dragons. There's actually this show on Prime Video called Vox Lux, which is just an independently produced television show about a, a Dungeons and Dragons game that a bunch of people played together. The people started to like so much that it wound up becoming uh, a, a TV series. Um, so what is the problem with Creative Commons though? So there actually have been some problems that have led it to led it away from from being as prevalent as it could be. So one. You have in or, using the Creative Commons license requires attributing all the authors of the original creative works, which can be convenient, inconvenient when you're when you're leveraging works that are based on multiple other, based on a whole chain of other people's works. Um, so, like a lot of people have just have just. Um, a lot of people have argued that it will just erode creativity to do this because people. In, in creating something have to trace down who all the authors are, they have to credit them, they have to get their permission, etc. Then critics have also worried that there's no obligation, the Creative Commons license doesn't provide any sort of requirement to, to kick back revenue to the original creators. So they thought that if people are just, if there's a system where people are going to be creating stuff and having other people building on their work and not being paid for it, it's just gonna, it's gonna degrade trust and people aren't gonna wanna be putting their works out there. And then finally, there's no central database of creative common works that, that's controlling. So really just, if you want to leverage someone else's work, it's completely on you to enforce the contract on one side and it's on, and it's on the other person to, to trace down whoever it is. Like this is just simply a legal framework that can be extended. There's no, there's absolutely no central database. So granted that now we're 20 minutes in and I've been talking about the entertainment industry and I haven't even touched on blockchain yet. Let's get into the reason why we're here. How does this whole problem get solved by blockchain? And that is through tokenized IP. So everything that I just talked about is solvable through blockchain. And as I've been discussing with Brett over the last couple of weeks, we are, are, we are on the absolute beginning end. We haven't even seen the beginning of this revolution yet. This is where blockchain is heading. And this is what I personally have been trying to figure out as much as possible to map out where it's going. We're already seeing investment in, in startups in this space, uh, you know, like start to pop up. But the way that blockchain can can play into solving this problem is that a lot of people think, and I'm gonna assume that this community, if you're here in the first place, you are at least somewhat up to date on what blockchain is. So there's so many people out there that still think that when they hear the blockchain, about the term blockchain, all they think about is, oh, a system to overthrow the banks and the governments. That is actually just what, that's just the, the fun narrative that sort of, you know, has that it's been spun into. All blockchain exists to do is to eliminate the need for trust in systems. And what do we have here? We have a system that actually works between creative commons and collaborative storytelling. What it is missing is trust 
And frankly, there's also the other part of the ability to seamlessly pay revenues to, to actually automate a revenue stream and take the sort of hassle out of, out of paying royalties and whatnot. But blockchain does both of those things. So what you can do with a what you can do with blockchain is you can you can um create a system. I, you know what? In order to actually tell you how to do it, I'm just going to show you this illustrative view. I know it's like a little bit crude, but this, because I, I threw it together, but I want to give you, rather than sort of just explain to you technically under the hood, how tokenized IP can help this system. I just want to show you an illustrative example of how something like this would work. So basically, let's just say on Reddit, on Twitter, this can really be absolutely anything. I've just wrote written short story in the first bucket, but it could be absolutely anything. This could be like a piece of art. This could be a picture. And this does happen, right? There's actually, um, you know, I, I won't get too deep into the details of specific examples just because they get boring sometimes when people don't know them. But there is an online stor story called The Back Rooms. It's basically, it's this concept of, of liminal spaces. It all started on 4chan when somebody posted this picture of what looks like a creepy empty office room with like with weird dim yellow lights and absolutely no windows. And the story is basically, if you walk you know, through the crack of a sidewalk wrong, you'll no clip into the back rooms. And it has become, and the only way to get out is to play through its level. And this has become, a massive online collaborative story that you can see it on, it spans all channels from TikTok to Reddit to the internet, et cetera, and to, to the rest of the internet. And it actually served as the inspiration for the Apple TV Plus show, Severance. And they, I read an interview with the creator, they seek to they seek to credit the creator there was absolutely no way to find it there's just there was no documentation of this whole thing imagine if these writers who were sitting online and were sitting online and just adding to something that was actually being consumed by tons of people to the extent that it was actually in, that it was actually inspiring an apple tv plus show imagine if they could get a little bit of kickback for that and also a writing credit on a major studio produced show on their resume right that there is a huge huge barrier to entry in the writing industry these days there is i think how many of us there you know like i i have this discussion in this debate with people all the time is there a content shortage i think that especially during times like this like this writer strike it is undoubted that there is a con a content shortage because the netflixes of the world have nothing to buy and nothing getting made but in general i think that there is i, I you know i a lot of I, I do a lot of sort of like side of desk work to actually try and put numbers to this content shortage. But people always want to, people always want to watch screen entertainment. And right now, it is just it's really hard to become a writer. It, uh, it, anyhow, I'm going to get into this. Um, I'm going to get into this example. So this is this is an alternate view of how it works. So first, somebody creator number one writes a short story, and in writing that short story, they are, that is actually minted as an NFT on the blockchain. So again, NFTs are sort of like thought of as monkey pictures. That's not what they are. An NFT literally just means a token on the blockchain that is, is unique. So, and what I mean by unique is it's a story. It's something. It's more than just something that's interchangeable for something else. So that is minted onto the blockchain. There is now a permanent immutable record of that creator actually putting actually putting this short story online. Creator two comes around and says, hey, that's really cool. I wanna to add to this story. They mint another NFT that has to inherit all the characteristics from the short story. I mean, I'm essentially, for those of you who know programming, I'm talking about Java classes, but for creative writing. Um, then, and you must inherit it and you must inherit it from the first notch in the story and that's and yeah when when you inherit it it um it's it like the same um, the same immutable record is minted then we get to creator three and four these guys actually come up with their own and and these each of these two guys come up with their entries into the series um and they're different though like they actually branch in two different directions now we get down to creators five six and seven oh, i didn't realize those were on other lines um these guys you got creator five, who's a fan of creator three's work. And then you have creator six and seven, who weren't such a fan of creator three's work, but they really liked creator four's work. So they start building on that. Then we finally get to the bottom. And this is where a, a system like this really comes into play. 
Um, so let's talk about these two types of these two types of end consumers differently. First, we have curators, and when I when I talk about curators, I'm talking about film studios. Imagine oh, right now the way that Disney works is you know, and I keep using Disney as an example, but I could use any. Disney owns all of their IP. So the way that they really retain control over their businesses is that they own the IP that they, that, that all the IP that they make entertainment off of. And this, you know, a lot of people say that the pro the current problems in the, the entertainment industry are caused by you know, distributors taking too big of margins or et cetera, but the real monopoly lies in IP ownership. There is IP, as we talked about, is a low cost and extremely high mar margin commodity. And it is the type of it is the type of property that all of its creators should be benefited for, and nobody should be forced to take a full buyout. Um, so if we, by decentralizing IP and actually creating a framework for it to be owned and for it to be identified, who all the creators in the going through the the chain are, and actually to be able to have it also built in that there are royalty how the royalties flow through. That is that can solve a lot of the current problems. It can make it a lot more beneficial, right? Some a kid who is in Wisconsin in his parents' basement without connections to Hollywood, but at the same time with with really strong writing talents who wants to make it can sit there and write a short story and actually get a credit on a Hollywood film and maybe even get some royalties too, right? Like we we acknowledge that there's certain things that are always going to be. They're, they're always going to be in balance. The curators are always the studios. It's going to take a while to topple over. It's not like we can completely displace them out of the system, but they can at least have a system in place that automates an easier way to that automates an easier way to share revenue and to actually properly credit. Then we get into the topic of AI. When it comes to AI, this is a huge, huge problem driving in, in part the writer's strike right now is uh, people don't want AI taking their jobs. The truth is AI is probably inevitable. I mean, these systems just work so well, there's no reason for us not to use them. But having said all that, um, you know, AI doesn't just come out of nowhere. AI is actually trained off of inputs. And there should be a way to know if an AI is creating, every AI that is creating something that even presents the possibility to take a human's job is trained off of a human's work. So it's the same thing. A system like this could also be used to identify and keep track keep track of what what creative material, what what IP an AI has been trained off of. So essentially, where you know this is sort of like uh, my plan here is to actually open up the floor and ha to have people really drill the topic in and let me know where you want to know more, or I can provide more examples, etc. Um, but the the concept here is just that you know we within blockchain we have an opportunity to uh, to attribute and automatically provide royalties and obviously lawyers will still be will still be needed you know this this isn't just like this isn't a built in solution revenue models will probably be different and revenue share will be different you know the first question you'd likely ask is how do you decide the weighting of something like this how do you decide sort of there, you know, there's questions like, what do you do if, what do you do if somebody actually goes ahead and just uses this anyways? Like, there's going to need to be real lawyers involved. It's still, it's still IP, but this is a framework for, this is a framework for creating more trust and creating more opportunity and more visibility and more credit. I mean, it's attribution. And most of all, it removes the need for trust from from collaborative storytelling. It actually allows collaborative storytelling to happen. The exact problems that happened when Fifty Shades of Grey killed the fan fiction community, it can bring, it can allow that, you know, we have proof there of a viable, just completely collaborative, decentralized commu community that actually produced something with incredibly strong market viability that not only was a best-selling book, but also adapted to a movie. Um, like we have proof of that. So let's just bring trust back into it. And that's all blockchain is in this situation, right? We go back to this framework and that's what we're just talking about here. Up at, up until here, up until this, up until the red circle, like this, this already happens, but it has been, as we said, creative commons is a great concept, but 
we don't have the ability to track and trace the way that you actually need to, which, which hinders people's ability to actually leverage the license. And collaborative storytelling requires trust, which is killed because too often one person takes the credit for many people's work and they have absolutely no way to prove it. And then from there, that can be that's leveraged by studios or leveraged by curators, let's just say, and they develop it into a whole bunch of different across a whole bunch of different channels in order to build love for that IP. And that isn't a modern entertainment company. And this is where, yeah, this is just, this is the new value chain. And we just add one more thing to it so that we can actually really make use of this fourth bucket. I'll take a pause there. Um, you know, I hope I didn't go too much into mad scientist mode and that that was coherent, but um, yeah, feel free, like, please just just grill me, even if you are skeptical, like, like ask, ask questions, say whatever you want. Let's, you know, this is like a speculative topic, so let's test it right now. Jay, there are, there are no skeptics in the group. <laughs> <laughs> there are no skeptics in blockchain. Uh, pretty awesome uh, uh, so far. Um, the, we're getting a little bit of feedback in the in the chat here, but I I brought up a couple of questions for you. Let me give you the first one here. Yeah. See, so we can uh, spin this off. You know what? Leave that. Can you leave that uh, that uh, that yep. diagram you have up there? I mean, I think that's pretty good. It really gets people thinking yeah, about, yeah. Uh, about what what that's, we have going on here. Absolutely. Here, let me put it back up. Sorry, I'm no no off, no no working off of two screens here. Um, okay. Coming back. That, that last slide. Yep. Um, all right, here we go. Okay, great. Uh, the next one. Oh, yeah. And I'm just going to pop the chat back up. There we so go. I Beautiful. So the, um, my first question uh, is, how difficult do you think it's going to be Given your experience in entertainment and uh, your experience with uh, Deloitte, uh, seeing the uh, the practical side of things and seeing the uh, the impractical side of things, yeah. um, you know, it's a perfect world in uh, in in consulting. It it always yeah. is. It's like it's a perfect world in legal. You know, there's there it's cut and dry. It's black and white. The entertainment industry is the furthest thing from black and white you can get. Mm -hmm. uh, trust is something that uh, th that is always in the back of people's minds. So how difficult is it going to be to get the industry to trust this new technology? And how long do you think it's going to take? Like how many iterations of whatever it is we build do we have to go through before people say, you know what, that works? Or are we going to get you know pushback from the industry, regardless of how efficient we make it. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I'll like, let me answer that question from two angles. Um, because I think there's two elements to trust. Um, one is the actual legality of it. So, I mean, what I can tell you within Deloitte Canada, where I work, we are currently working with the department of finance. It's one of our engagements to help them, to help them, uh, develop a regulatory frame, a framework for regulating the crypto and digital assets industry. What I can tell you just from through that engagement is this is going to be this, this entire market is going to become legal. You know, scams within it are not, are not going to be legal, but digital assets and tokenization, it is all coming. The governments are, it has been plain and simply acknowledged at this point that the, the truth of the matter, which is Bitcoin, the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks have reached full decentralization and governments have two choices, have a legal market or a black market. So as far as that goes, and that's, I know this is the really light side of it, trust will come through the fact that regulatory frameworks are going to be drafted. And even despite the fact that the US is lagging a little bit behind the EU, Australia, UK, et cetera, um, it'll happen very soon. And furthermore, you know, right now we're talking about the world of NFTs um, and NFTs aren't even in scope yet. Even with the Markets and Crypto Act that uh, the EU just released, it's the first piece of regulation for crypto um, that's been actually passed through and, and will be entering force. It um, it doesn't even, NFTs aren't in scope yet. So this area is actually a free-for-all for a bit. Um, I'm just going to jump onto the other side of trust, which is consumer trust. You know, what I can say from consulting, from my experience, is that 
Business trust is actually secondary and less important to consumer trust. We Our engagements come through when a would-be a client or a would-be client notices that there is that their consumers are demanding crypto enabled or blockchain enabled products. So to me, um, what is required, you know, to answer that simple, simple question, what is required for industry trust? One, it has to be legal, which is already happening. And two, the use cases have to be viable. We're like in an early stage where crypto is just a casino now. Um, I think that gaming and entertainment are really the easiest places because it's for are the easiest places for trust to be built because it is a place where you can experience an intangible that is traded for a tangible. It's a perfect example of how you balance the idea of an unbacked crypto with value on the other side. Ideas are tangible. So, you know, like, you know, getting into jumping over to video gaming, let's, let's look at like Call of Duty, right? Um, if any, if there are any gamers here, if you're playing a video game and you kill someone and you take a rare gun off of them, like, if you can just mint that into your own possessions, that's worth that. That is actually worth something because it has utility. So in virtual worlds where your possessions are already virtual, you have utility, and we get to story writing. So for me, I like I really like collaborative storytelling as an early area of as an early use case where this can really thrive because these communities already exist and they require trust. And there's a really low barrier to entry for them. Like they, for them, they just need to be able to trust each other. And if, and if what it is that, and what if, and if, if what builds that trust is blockchain, then they trust blockchain. So I don't know. I, I hope, I know I rambled a bit there. I hope that was like, you know, a sufficient sort of um, answer, but yeah, like feel free to, in the chat to tell me if you want to hear more. I also saw a question about and I'm just trying to get my um my chat back up. Um, so we have the legal community learning and on board about this new trust model. Um, yes, we actually do. I mean, you know, like for all I know, there's IP lawyers in this room. Like this is actually a very simple topic. Like we are literally just talking about about the Creative Commons license, which already exists. Just giving it a, a little more automation. Just like taking an already existing legal framework and like that's public and just giving it giving it some more some more what's the word strength some more uh like some more power um so that's all this is um i'm looking at the best what's the best way to get storytellers to understand the opportunity and how to apply the tools and techniques of blockchain yes okay so there's two ways to do it one is and this is the same for absolutely everything we've discussed um, that we'll ever discuss in blockchain. Blockchain needs to be tucked under the hood. Like, unless you're working in payments, you don't know about how Swift enables cross-border payments. When you tap your credit card and pay at the and pay at the grocery store or like at your corner store, you know, you're not asking whether this is being powered by Shopify or by like, you know, or by FedNow or FedWire or the, the Visa or MasterCard network, right? Like rails are tucked, trust and payment rails need to be tucked under the hood. So that's first off. In fact, you know, the term blockchain itself is almost is almost a negative connotation. Like, and I think we all agree that that's got to go away at some point and it's going to. Um, what's the best way to get storytellers to understand the opportunity? So, you know, this is an interesting question because it's delicate and it's going to require trial and error. Like there is, so there's on Reddit, I, I, you know, this, there's this like community that I love. It's, um, it started based on a short story. It's called Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. And basically some guy just wrote this creative story about how underneath the whole state of Texas, there's just a giant dead animal that's been dead and nobody knows what it is. And there's been a theme, a theme park built inside it. And this grew into a giant collaborative online story where you had the most talented designers like creating just the, the animal, the species and fauna that grow inside this like giant organic mass. And it's just like, these are, these people are so beyond smart. You have people creating like open source video games, et cetera. So one of the ways to do something like this would be to go to an existing community like that and say, hey, do you want to transplant your community into here? 
Now, of course, it goes without saying that there's a, a, a non-zero chance that for a lot of the people in this community, sort of making it a little more about credit and giving the opportunity to monetize it could actually destroy it. Like there's just, there's some communities that will die in the, in the, in the event of trying, of putting them into an environment that exists for the purpose of allowing it to be like competitive and purchased by curators. But for the, all you need is just one good story on there, right? Like all you need is just, and like something like the back rooms, you couldn't put on there. There's too many people. You'd have to trace them all back. It would kill the process. So you do need to just find a young community and, and convince them to come over to put their story on. And, and then you just need to open it up. Like the, the, the point of the story is that everybody is, you know, there's massive communities doing this already that for free. So why not give them the opportunity to benefit off of it? I can't say if I don't, if you don't know, P, uh, or actually I see plenty of angles past legals, but actually I say, I just want a company to work for it to be, and mostly blockchain must come under higher restrictions. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and I saw you put a, a t another question earlier. I thought of a game plot that's the basis, um, then build a new comic strip from events. Exactly. So on what you said earlier, like, something like this you would actually be able to put that on there and create as many new um like you know upload your story upload your comic onto the blockchain have it minted there and the and people could actually just build onto it right everybody hits writer's block like story writing is collaborative there's a whole bunch of you know there's there's just like within writing rooms within like just look at any at studio films you have these fox films these you know the dc the dc sort of cinematic universe has become a bit of a laughing stock just because its narrative structure has fallen apart and like this is the type of thing where if we if we can start with a system like this this is sort of a model for true disruptive innovation right like they talk about disruptive innovation as being a company, a new a new entrant to the market targets the low end fit foothold of the market who don't want to pay for something. So Netflix came in and and that sorry and that the incumbent doesn't care to serve because they're not valuable enough. So Netflix came in and said, "We are going to Blockbuster exists, but they charge late fees. We are going to chart. We're going to target the portion of the market that doesn't want to pay late fees, and they're they're willing to trade off for something. They're willing to trade off and not have access to the newest movies. And then over time, the disruptor grows and actually envelops the incumbent. And then the incumbent experiences the innovator's dilemma, which is, do we turn around and actually put the time and resources into building what our disruptor has, or do we just try and continue with our business model? And most of the time, once a company is already facing the innovator's dilemma, unless the, the unless the disruptor slips up they're pretty much done by that point and so in this case what we are talking about in, in a disruptive model like this is that a company comes in and starts targeting the people who who aren't who are just using the most free simple form of entertainment like text and image stories online and we test it out on that market and then over time like what this becomes is really valuable IP that, can't be purchased. I mean, and if it can, it benefits all of its creators, but really it just, over time we create a new model where IP is a decentralized entity and everything else is, you have these companies working together around it who all specialize. Film companies become film production companies, TV production companies become TV production companies. The Disney's of the world aren't even worried about trying to, and the Netflixes aren't trying to worry about launching video game studios in house. They're just plain and simply like someone else is out, a video game studio is out there partaking in the IP and just building the value of this IP and this franchise on their own. And it's really just a win win situation for everybody. Um, you know, this model is not about disrupting the big content creators, it's actually just about raising the tide for everyone at once but especially for the creators because right now it's really hard for them to break in right like you can't just get a credit on a disney show by having a good idea but in this model you can like and so such as should be the case so yeah i mean um yeah let me <laughs> exhausting transmedia value yeah i mean like fair enough honestly like 
I, the word exhausting is a little bit um is a little bit like daunting because I feel like that means that it's 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 spent up. But I would say like optimizing maybe. <laughs> does, does that make sense? Hey Jay, tell me how much pressure do you think the studios and the the industry participants that would be most affected negatively by this sort of uh, collaborative approach to IP, how much pressure could they exert on the technology not being adopted? In your opinion, what what do you, what, what do you feel the, the the dark side of 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 bringing uh, 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 transparency to uh, transparency and equality to this whole to certain aspects or certain components to the industry but um see i don't know if this is a non-answer but the way i see it like these communities are going to build like they're going to build out of view of the studios like by the time the studios even know they exist it will be because there is a story with a fan base, the level of Game of Thrones, that has just emerged online and that has a completely, that's been written in a decentralized manner, but which has like a full, which has a full record of ownership and creation. Um, I, and at that point, yeah, sure, the studios can choose to say, you know, like there will be an interesting moment in time to observe, which will be like, could we ever hit a point where Disney is in a position where they have the ability to create, where this whole new giant franchise has has emerged. Disney has the ability to create it, but they have to stray outside of their out of their model of if to stray outside of their model of of owning all the IP that they build, or they have to pay a pretty penny for it to actually bring it in, which involves hiring all the writers on it, which actually is great. So I mean, to me, like to me, by the time if you have a, a massive like entertainment conglomerate actually taking notice of this, it can only be a good thing because either competition is fully in force or they are acquiring it and we're bringing and and the model works and we're actually bringing de we're using decentralized storytelling to just bring more creators into the into the actual industry. We have a question here from Etienne. Uh, how do yep. you incentivize creators to contribute to IP? Creator credit and dollars? That's in the chat. Yeah. Track. So, I mean, this is an interesting one because depending on who does it and how, there's tons of different possible models. What I'm just going to say to keep this answer simple right now is if right now in these collaborative storytelling communities, they're doing it for free with no credit. So what I, what you know what it, what will incentivize creators? Anything more than that, literally anything more than that. Maybe it's maybe you know, like somebody purchases a, a piece of a, a, you know like a big piece of this of an IP chain for for let's say ten dollars and one person gets a dollar. It's a dollar more than they would have gotten otherwise. and and or maybe there's no money involved at all, but they they get to have a credit on something and their resume gets to be better. So I like I don't you know I don't want this to be a cop out answer, but there's a million ways for that to happen. And in this case, like just you incentivize them by making it exactly what they're doing, but just like a, a sh even so much as a shred more of incentive, all the way up to all the way up to like getting getting like a full credit on a Hollywood movie with a big paycheck and and like uh you know and and, op and your career actually launched in hollywood through this good good answer good answer tell me the um is there for those creators that are going to be uh that are on zoom currently or going to watch it down the road are there any really reputable uh collaborative uh sites I mean, you're talking about Reddit, but is there any place that you would recommend that would be a, uh, or you could suggest, you, you, can you give us something in the chat there that uh, that you like for um, for collaborative storytelling and something that people could start to contribute and maybe we could look at approaching in terms of uh, doing a pilot on uh, on doing some IP stuff on blockchain with some of these groups. 
Have you got a recommendation of a popular or a, a, a suite of popular sites? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, there's not, there aren't that many. That's the thing. There actually is a bit of a gap. Like there is, um, there's a subreddit called r slash world building. Like this is, um, it's sort of, you know, this was cruising this particular subreddit was actually what really inspired me to all this in, in the first place. Like it's kind of exactly what I described and people will tag the actual world they're talking about and they'll introduce some art. Someone will just come in and say, here's a map that I create that I came up with for a mystical land, like some kind of Lord of the Rings type thing. It is, it is notable that fantasy and science fiction are like really the areas where this thrives, where this, where these communities thrive the most. Excellent. I'm uh, looking at uh, Eric is uh, contributing here quite a bit in the chat. Some good stuff, Eric. The, uh, um, just looking at uh, at PI here. Eric has a blog space for multiple post stories. What to tell? I did put a uh, I did put a link to the um, the uh, Mystery Flesh Pit National Park in the chat for anybody that's uh, on the Reddit the World Building site. So that's in there. That's pretty good. Do we have any other questions from the uh, from the Zoom. All right. Well, I mean, I guess um, I hope everyone was. I hope people here were able to take something from this. Can we uh, maybe get some? You know, if there are no questions. Maybe some. Uh, let me like you know. Let me know. Just write in the chat. Like, did people find this interesting? Was this like was this useful? Was this um? Did people glean insight out of this? Was it was it delivered um, in a way that was sort of like how did it come across to actual blockchain natives? Because you know it, it is funny. This is a topic that um what. What chain is focus? Um, oh yeah, here my LinkedIn. What, here, yeah, I'll post my LinkedIn here. It's on the thing. Um, what chain is focus? Honestly, this like it's chain agnostic, right? Like you could have an entire custom chain, like that's a fork of anything, or a custom chain that's um like this could be its own network. It could be an entire network that's just like you know IP focus, or you could just as easily have like I don't know, um, like it could be on Ethereum, like. There's actually, I would say there's, you know, this is almost a use case where there's almost a use case where Ethereum actually makes sense, right? Because it, the high transaction fees will incentivize like only posting stuff that you are really confident in. But then again, could be Polygon or as we're here today, could be Hyperledger on a permission network where there's actually like, you know, there's an operating model that allows for no gas fees and when needed allows you to bridge off into EVM or, or EVM competitor networks. But really, you know, like I do think a permission network like Hyperledger is a great place for something like this to live. And we'll have no, we'll have no, uh, we'll have no issues uh, interoperating with the other chains, public or other private chains. So that's the goal. The goal would be to uh, do, build something on Fabric, Hyperledger Fabric, and using the connectors to uh, take some of it out into uh, the public world of blockchain. So, and uh, payments, et cetera, that's going to be something that needs to be needs to be discussed and obviously hash, hashed out with the uh, the industry. They, they don't want to have to get involved in uh, in uh, dealing with some of the uh, the intricacies of uh, of uh, legal uh, payments, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for sure, all of the chains that, uh, you know, can be, this can, this can be applicable to all the chains. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like obviously stable value too, like, like if we're looking at least amount of friction to adoption, then we'd want to be looking at like 
stable coin payments, right? Like some, some an area where $1 equals $1 uh, as opposed to, but that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. I kind of like intentionally left the legality of payments aspect out of this, but it is half of what I work on day to day. So I could talk anyone's ear off about that, but we'll save well, that for it, another day. That's uh, that's a good uh, point to uh, move off here, Jay. Let's uh, start talking about uh, doing an actual presentation on your, your skill in that side of the industry, because I think that's going to be very interesting. So let, let's go you and I offline and talk a little bit about uh, what our next, uh, our, what our next event will be. And um, we'll ask everyone to, uh, to follow our LinkedIn page, connect with uh, Jay on LinkedIn and uh, prepare for the next event and um, whatever else we we have in store to work on together. I'm looking forward to it. Anything else just, from anyone there? And Jay, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I just dropped my LinkedIn in the chat. But yeah, anything else? I'm good. We're, we're, we're pushing our hour here. Jay, I want to thank you so much. It was a phenomenal presentation. And I know that, uh, that everybody that was in here enjoyed it for sure. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, like I said, just follow up if there's absolutely anything you want to talk about anybody, you know, this, this is like, this is not a pitch. This is not anything. This is just me like trying to inspire all the people building in this community because I'm passionate about this use case. So reach out to me if you want to talk about it, because, um, because, you know, that's the reason why we're here. I'll attest to that. Jay is demonstrating clear, uh, your motivations are admirable, and uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. So we look forward to working with you and everybody. This this is uh, being recorded. It'll be on the Hyperledger uh, website under in their YouTube with probably within the next couple of hours. So you'll have a look, and uh, we'll send a link out onto our LinkedIn page to the video. Everyone, have a great day, Jay. Thank you again. It was good to see you, and it was a great presentation. Thanks so much. Have a Thanks great day, so much, everyone. Brett. Yep. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Take Thanks care. so much, Brett. And Brett, thank you so much for the invite and for uh, for hosting. <laughs> All right. Take care, Jared. Bye.